I'm really just big broadly um, on the tie between professional development and personal development um, as an ongoing process within your career. And so that's another aspect of smart health education that I wanted to bring to the table that I think somewhat is lacking in the field. We do a lot on, on professional development, you know, making sure that you gain the hard skills, but it's also the soft skills that are really important and that's ongoing. And so I wanna fill that gap as well so that you're also focused on kind of how we started this, this podcast, just time management is so key, building strong habits, like focusing on your, your mental health and, you know, managing burnout, like shout out to Marissa, right? <laughs> like, and the work that she's doing, it's all of that's important for public health professionals because it ultimately impacts how we serve others. And so that's, that's kind of where I see myself falling in the scheme of things. This is the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, where you'll hear about diverse career stories, career strategies, get tips, and learn from others to help you in your public health career journey. If you want to learn about public health, public health careers, or just hear public health stories, stay tuned because you won't want to miss this. Welcome to the Public Health Millennial Career Stories Podcast, episode number 99. Hi everyone, this is Omari Richens, the Public Health Millennial. Follow me at the PH Millennial. Thank you so much. And that's on Instagram. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast or the YouTube channel or wherever you're listening or watching this. Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Leave a like if you're on YouTube. Be sure to leave a review, a five-star review. Let me know what you think about the show. I would greatly appreciate that and it helps people people get more familiarized with the show and uh, also share with a friend who you think these stories would be useful for. I would greatly appreciate that. I really enjoyed today's conversation. It's with someone who I hopped onto Twitter Spaces with a couple of weeks back, and I enjoyed hearing more of her story, more of her insights, and I think that she has some great, great insights, especially for students and, and people that are just thinking about going and doing your MPH, how to think through that. Uh, I really enjoyed today's episode as with a guest that I, I chatted with a little bit on uh, Twitter Spaces a couple of weeks back, and I really enjoyed digging in more to her story and hearing about how she got to where she is and the insight that she's doing, as well as like how she thought about building out her business. And I think it's really great information for anyone thinking about going into public health. Um, she drops a lot of great insights, and I think you will find it valuable. So uh, yeah, tap into this and... Uh, I hope that you all enjoy. Today, we have someone who loves designing programs, but hates to sell herself. She has 10 years of designing, implementing, and evaluating professional development programs for public health professionals and healthcare executives. She got a bachelor's degree in health promotion at the University of Georgia, then got a master of public health at Emory University. She is the founder of Smart Health Education, LLC, where they focus on connecting the dots between training design and engaging learning experiences in public health and also works as Director of Healthcare Programs at the Health Management Academy. Be sure to follow her on Instagram at Smart Health Education. We have Kimberly Green Warren, MPH. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really glad that we get to reconnect. I knew that we were on Twitter spaces uh, <laughs> a couple of weeks back. Uh, for the first time, I think, for both of us. <laughs> exactly. It was it was a very good experience, but it was fun. It was fun to, to hop on and a chat with you. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Had a lot of fun as well. Awesome, awesome. So, so how are you doing and how have you been coping during these times? How am I doing? Uh, I think we are all in this stage of adapting, right, for the last two years. So I feel like I'm at a stage where, you know, you want to take a breather, but you realize that you just have to adapt to each day, what comes your way. Um, so for me, coping what I've um, picked up over the last two years, I'm, a, I'm someone who realizes I really value my quiet time in the mornings. So I've been intentional about that and I think that's helped me cope. And that includes reading. Um, I try to read for about 30 to 45 minutes, like listen to an audiobook or read on my phone. Um, I'm, I'm someone that still uses, like I, I read digital books, eBooks, which I think most people hate, but I love it. Um, and then I journal. So 
I try to do that every morning. It's part of my morning routine. And I think that's helped me cope and kind of ground myself. Um, and then obviously leaning on my support system, right? And making sure I'm building in time to fill my cup, which includes spending quality time with my friends and family. So that's how I've been trying to cope. But I think we're all in a constant state of adapting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I appreciate you sharing that. And I, I think that that's awesome that like you have a self-care, self-care routine set out in your morning routine and you're able oh, yeah. to stick to that. And like, I think just building habits like that are so beneficial to like life and, and development. How, how, right. how early do you, do you typically get up? Um, I've actually tried to build this down to a system. So try to figure out how early do I need to get up? I cannot get to the five o'clock hour. I know there's like a 5 a.m. club. I can't ever get there. Um, but if I start work at nine, I realize for me to wake up slowly, that's how I, that's how I titled my quiet time. Um, I probably need to work, wake up around 6.37. So if I work at, wake up at 6.30, I have plenty of time to read, journal, wake up slowly and start my day by nine. So I try to do that every day. Yeah, 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 that's awesome. Um, and yeah, I hope that you're able to keep up that habit and like build other habits along with that as, as you go. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it's crucial. It's now it's, it's, it's more, it's ingrained in me. Like I have to do it. If I don't, if I don't wake up and I'm not able to read and journal every single day, I, my day feels off. Yeah, and, and I, I guess before, before I move on to the next day, I think like people think of like self-care as going and doing all these maybe like getting your nails done or I don't know why I'm yeah. doing gender specific but like yeah. doing, doing like uh, crazy things yeah. like that but self-care is literally just building habits that make mm-hmm. you feel centered in your day and I think that that's mm-hmm. a better way to approach it so I appreciate you saying that and I, I'm sorry absolutely. for any girls who will get their nails done no no no, <laughs> no absolutely I completely understand people think that you have to spend a whole bunch of money but it's really like you said about grounding yourself so that you feel um you feel great starting out each day. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Okay, so how do you identify and then tell us a little bit about your personal background? So how do I identify um, she, her? Uh, I am, um, consider myself black. My background, I come from a, a first generation. I come from a, a Jamaican background. Both of my parents are originally from Jamaica, uh, moved up here in their early 30s. I grew up in Atlanta in a strong Jamaican community. So sometimes I always tell people I feel a little bit foreign when it, <laughs> when it comes to my childhood because I grew up in such a strong Jamaican community that you couldn't really tell me different <laughs> that I wasn't from Jamaica, but obviously I didn't live in Jamaica, um, but it shaped me hands down, being able to um, see your parents navigate this country and what they sacrifice and what your family has sacrificed and also what they pour into you as their child. I think that's like guided somewhat my career and why I'm so service oriented um, and it's why I'm so focused on making an impact. Um, I think it all stems from um, being able to like personally witness your parents kind of start from the ground up and build themselves up to where they are now. And then the diversity that you find just being with a West Indian background and the various cultures and how you navigate that uh, growing up in the South and all of that, so. Yeah, well, I appreciate you sharing that. That was a a good little backstory on you and growing up and like how, I guess a little bit about your public health background before getting into public health and all of that and I think a lot of people have a lot of, a lot of first generation people have a lot of similar stories to tell or mm-hmm. so, so I'm glad that you shared that and before we get into your collegiate career what does mm-hmm. public health mean to you? Ooh, what does public health mean to me? Um, whenever I think about public health sometimes which this is a funny story it's related but it might sound off my undergrad degree they made us write out a personal statement and I my undergrad degree is in health education and health promotion and they made us write out a personal statement before we graduated and of course you hate it right it's like three pages long who likes writing a personal statement on why you know <laughs> you want to do anything in public health and health so 
but honestly, I think back to it sometimes and I'm like, that really encompasses what, like why I'm in public health and I don't want to butcher it, but it's basically giving people the freedom and the autonomy and the tools to live the life that they want because health doesn't come with a manual, right? And so I see public health as a means of empowering folks to take more control of their health, not individual, we're, we're talking systems, right? Every single level of the individual, organizational, um, you know, system level, but cr creating those tools so that people are able to have the freedom to live the life that we want, because we know that health impacts every aspect of our life, i.e. the COVID-19 pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. So I see public health as a means of giving people the tools to live the life that they want. Yeah, and I think that's important to just highlight because when we think about public health, we're thinking about getting people their basic needs most of the time, like making sure they have health insurance, making sure they're clean water, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. seat belts, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the real goal of that is to get people out of like fighting for their basic necessities mm -hmm. and actually re realizing like their potential in life and getting to, mm -hmm. to live the life that they want. So I'm glad mm -hmm. that you highlighted that. Yeah, absolutely. That's how I see it. And every aspect of public health touches that. When we do our jobs right, people are able to live the life, the, the life that they want because they're not thinking about these adverse consequences of their health, right? Mm -hmm. Adverse consequences that impact their health. Mm -hmm. And it's also dope that that you you like went through this writing a personal statement in undergrad, uh, despite it being hard and you not enjoying it. I think because even like reflected on on myself when I was doing applying for um, my master's of public health program, writing a personal mm -hmm. statement really gets you to sit down and reflect and think and think about okay, what what are the things I need to do? And I think having that vision or that why early on definitely is is very helpful. Absolutely. So don't knock it, anyone listening. Yeah. <laughs> it might help you 12 years down the line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, so you got your Bachelor's of Science in Health Promotion at University of Georgia. So mm -hmm. did you go in as a health science major or was it thought process going into undergrad? Um, I, have, I think I have a similar story as most folks. I thought I wanted to be a doctor. I um, realized very quickly that I did not like chemistry, whatever, 101 and physics 101 that was immediate. So that was basically sitting down in the class the first one to two days and realizing this was never for me. Um, and from there, I decided that I still wanted to be a part of a service oriented. I wanted a service oriented major. I still wanted to be within the health profession. I never saw myself necessarily as a nurse or you know PT or anything like that. Um, and so the University of Georgia had a College of Public Health. I believe it started maybe one to two years before um, I started the program. So I looked into public health and I was like, yeah, this is totally my cup of tea. I can do community level work. I can, you know, work in a variety of settings. I can still um, impact health outcomes. So then naturally it was a fit. And ever since then, I, I went the health promotion, health education track. And truly, I have never looked back, ever. Yeah, fair enough. And I, I think I've heard that story uh, many a times on this podcast and in life, uh, just people going from, from pre-med like myself in, into mm -hmm. uh, public health, not during my bachelor's, but uh, I think mm -hmm. it's, gr it's great when there is that option for you to learn about these different things when you realize that chemistry, organic chemistry, all those things just aren't, aren't for you, you know, and, mm -hmm. and that's fine, that's fine, we need, we need people who are good at that, but we also need people who are good at the community and population health type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I also think it's a, it's a good lesson to also think about when, if you're in school, to, you know, you, you have to trust your gut, right, you know, instinctively, instinctively, uh, whether you do or do not like something right and not to say that you shouldn't push through anything that you're not good at it's just that also trust your gut and understand that if, if this isn't this isn't enjoyable for you if this is not something that you really want to learn more about it's okay to pivot you know there's other options out there as well yeah especially in the U.S. 
uh, college system where you're able to shift very, very seamlessly between things. Uh, yeah. So definitely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. So during your bachelor's, you were a childhood obesity initiative coordinator at the American mm -hmm. Diabetes Association. So how do you get that? And like, what, what do you do in it? Yeah. So I worked at the um, American Diabetes Association. It was actually one of our internship experiences. So Another great part about UGA's program is just the, the opportunity, but also the encouragement to pursue those internship opportunities that gave you just the experience in public health. And so the American Diabetes Association was a part of that. I remember I learned about sugar that summer. I still remember it to this day. We only should eat about 40 grams of sugar a day. And, you know, that's where I made, I, I, I think it's like basic health promotion that's that's creating. I remember I created a, you know, the trifold boards where we took to communities and educated them about sugar intake and where you find processed sugar and, um, you know, carbs and, you know, showing what it looks like in the body. So I love that work. You know, it, it, was, it was so simple when I think back, right? After all these years, but it affirmed again that it was okay for me to not take chemistry 101, right? Because I enjoyed working in the community, um, educating others, teaching them about a topic, a health topic that they knew nothing about, but, you know, could walk away and have the tools to, you know, navigate their, you know, nutritional intake. So, yeah, I didn't know that uh, you should be getting or the maximum amount of sugar is 40 grams a day. That, that's pretty, yeah. pretty, pretty crazy yes. con considering the things that are just generally out there and how much sugar they contain. I mean, I hope it's still the guidance now, but that's what, that's what I remember from it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, will, I will check that. And, uh, I'll put yeah, I'll, I'm going to Google it now. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. That's funny. Um, so, so did you have any other takeaways that you had um, during your your time at UG? Oh, yeah, takeaways. I I really enjoyed my practicum experiences. They really shaped me. Um, I remember I worked in a community garden, really enjoyed that work. I, I believe I reached out to him simply because I, I heard about community gardens and, um, and I and I just wanted to get involved. And there was one close to the school attached to an elementary school and they let me volunteer. And I really enjoyed that work. And then also I worked at a, um, a employee assistance program through Emory that I really enjoyed as well as a practicum experience. And so seeing the diversity of experiences within public health also opened my eyes and never made me feel as though there was only one track for me within public health. So I really appreciated my undergraduate experience because I think it gave me a diversity of experience and then also affirmed that, yeah, this is the track I wanted to go down. This is what I like. Okay, okay. Well, I'm glad that you were, you were able to get that. And yeah, it's, it's great when you are able to get that affirmation early on to, to this is what you want to do. And I did pull up, I Googled it and uh, I don't know if this Google is correct, but it says for men, it should be 36 grams and for women, yeah. 20, 25 grams. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so let's just clarify that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, well, that, that's that's crazy. But anyway, anyway. I'm, I'm, yeah, so go, go look on the back of anything and you're like, ooh. <laughs> basically just drink water this just is all water. my sugar intake for the day yeah <laughs> uh, okay okay so you graduated from your bachelor's uh, in science and then you went on and got a job as a health promotion and wellness coordinator at Emory faculty and staff assistance program so how do you come across that what do you do um you so after you said after I graduated oh, was this while you while you were working there while yeah. you went to school <laughs> Yes, the the employee assistance program. Uh, the yes, the staff assistance program. Yeah. Oh yes, the staff assistance program. I did, I believe. Yeah, I did that as my final practicum experience in college, and um, I came across that. Honestly, I want to say that I came across that because we, we had to complete a practicum experience. So it was one of those that were just built into the curriculum. 
-hmm. And I'm not, I, I completely forgot, I'm sorry, what, what connected me to um, Emory itself. I think it was in Atlanta for the summer and I needed an opportunity. And that might've been, that might've been just a list of public health organizations that they provided or, you know, healthcare organizations that you could potentially intern at. And so I reached out, I had the most amazing mentor. Oh my gosh, I should reach out to her right now. Her name was Dawn. And I also loved working there. Again, just the, the moral of the story is the more experience, the diversity of experiences you can, you can um, be a part of, the more it can like, help guide your career. And so I love that summer too, because I only work with, with employees of Emory. And so I could kind of see not only, I did community level work, but I saw what it felt like to serve, um, you know, on the organizational level and what type of health promotion, health education was needed to help employees on a day-to-day -day basis, which we all know who work full time. It's not once you work full time, you finally have your whole life together, right? You don't have to take care of your health. So the employee assistance program was very crucial for just providing that daily education to, to Emory employees with a variety of events. Um, as you imagine, Emory is humongous. So just being able to see that, witness that, and see also the work that they do for their residents as well. So their med school residents, um, just to obviously, it's a very stressful time for them. And so being able to provide that type of, to be able to provide that kind of care and health education so that they're able to take care of themselves during their residency period was a uh, very enlightening too. Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. And uh, I don't know how I messed that up, that it was your first job. No, no, no. Graduated. No, 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 it's fine, it's fine. <laughs> okay, so, but after you did graduate, you became a AmeriCorps volunteer health and mm -hmm. fitness advocate at the Health Federation of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. So before I asked, like, specifically about, like, how'd you, got, how'd you get that and what'd you do? Mm -hmm. After graduating with your bachelor's, were you thinking that you'd go on and get your master's of public health at, at that point? Like, what was what was the thought process for that? Or did you know you wanted to do this AmeriCorps program? Yeah, so my story is pretty hilarious. I think when I look back, um, I think I shared this on the Twitter space. I was all I was very gung ho public health pretty early after I switched from being pre med. Knew I needed to get my MPH because you can just look generally within the public health field and you see that you know, tons of folks have MPHs. That was always on my radar. Um, knew I wanted to go to Emory because I'm from Atlanta. So I just felt like it was a natural fit. I wanted to stay in Atlanta. Um, I did everything in my power to get into Emory. It was like my dream school. It was my dream career path. Um, and then I got in, hurrah, took the GRE, hurrah. Um, and I went to the first year orientation and there was something, they, one session and someone implied that once you leave grad school, you're gonna start your career. And for whatever reason, 21 year old me said, absolutely not, I can't do that. <laughs> I'm not ready to start my life. And so I backtracked and I said, I don't wanna do this. And of course, all my family and friends said, you're crazy. Cause I've been talking about going to Emory for two years and preparing for it. And so of course, I remember sitting in a classroom with my best friend and writing a pro-con list to going to Emory for grad school or doing something different, like taking a gap year. And I wrote this long pro-con list in our college library. And the, the pro list of taking the gap year was just a lot longer. And I also had a best friend who was also pursuing AmeriCorps. So I was like, hey, maybe I should look into AmeriCorps and they happen to have a health core. And so I said, okay, if I'm going to do the health core, I'm going to go to a place I know nothing about. And so the place I knew nothing about was Philadelphia. And so I applied, I got in. And so from there, I kind of researched, okay, well, what do I do with the Emory? Like, what do I do with the acceptance to Emory? Cause I'm not going to go to Emory anymore. And they had a, um, they allowed you to defer a year. So once you get in, you're able to defer. And I didn't know it, but they also had an AmeriCorps scholarship. So if I completed AmeriCorps, I could get, and went to Emory, I could get, um, they would 
double the education stipend that AmeriCorps gives you once you complete a term of service. So it actually all worked out in this weird way, uh, but that's what led me to AmeriCorps. And also think it was the best decision I could have made for myself as well. All right, well, shout out to you for, for actually like writing down a list of pros and cons and actually strategically thinking about it and then choosing to go with the AmeriCorps uh, route. So what, what, yeah. what kind of stuff did you do in Philadelphia and did you enjoy the new place that you knew nothing about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I moved to Philadelphia by myself, knew nothing about it, but I knew, you know, I was like, whatever, I'll, I'll figure it out. Like my best friend moved to Baltimore, so I knew she wasn't too far if I never needed something. Uh, but in the health court, it was, actually, I forgot how many, exactly how many of us it was. It was no more than, say, 30 of us in the health court for the year. We had a variety of projects that we worked in throughout Philadelphia. We were, uh, my, my placement in particular was at an elementary school. Shout out to Penrose Elementary School in Southwest Philly. I love you. Um, but I worked in a elementary school and actually served as a health and fitness advocate. What that meant was I basically ran all of the programs that the nurse manager for the school uh, organized through a variety of grants that he applied to. And also shout out to Nurse Bob, he was a saint. Um, so I worked with him very closely and he, he applied for so many grants for the school just to make sure all the kids could get the resources that they needed. And he used AmeriCorps volunteers to basically manage those grants. So it was, it's ran the gamut. It went from managing the dental, uh, truck that came and made sure that everyone had their regular cleanings, right? Kindergarten through eighth grade, all the way to helping kindergartners learn how to read, which I loved, all the way to running a, I ran an after school program focused on helping middle school students run the Philadelphia Half Marathon and we ran it with them um, because running was just a part of helping kids like mental health, obviously helps my, helps my mental health, right? Um, and then also helping them achieve a goal that they would never see for themselves. So those were just only, <laughs> you can see <laughs> dental stuff all the way to running um, and then everything in between. So that's like daily fitness activities, just various health programs. And then our biggest project was around organizing the MLK Day of Service for the entire Penrose community. So it wasn't just the school, it was also the larger community. And so I worked with my, um, one of my co-AmeriCorps volunteers, his name was Kenny, um, and we pretty much organized the whole day um, dedicated to service on MLK Day um, for the entire community. And that was tons of fun. So variety of experience, as you can see, um, but AmeriCorps was really about service. So what I enjoyed the most was just giving back but also those kids taught me so much I, I still I think about them to this day you know um, so that's that's just kind of a summary of what I did in Philly but it was a lot of fun really good experience I'm glad that you got to enjoy the new place and that does sound like a bunch of different things that were very helpful uh, not only in, in I guess like your public health career but like just personally for you to, to get in and to experience those different types of uh, yeah things. for sure so that was awesome how, how long were you in the America was that uh one year or two years mm -hmm. yes yeah, one year um one year program I loved it so much I tried to stay so I, I desperately tried to stay I was like okay well I love this work I love the work on the ground let me try to get a job in Philly there was a uh public health organization that I was eyeing that did a lot of work at the school that I was like, okay, they have an opening. I'll just stay in Philly and work for them. I'll go to grad school eventually. I applied, got to the third round, couldn't hear back in time. So I couldn't hear back in time before the first day of grad school. So because they couldn't give me an answer, I had to go to grad school. And so I went to grad school at Emory 
And then the second day of classes, I got the rejection email. So it was the right decision. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought you were about to say that you got accepted. They about to I give you like... <laughs> I did not. Every story is not roses, okay? <laughs> I, I went through a month. I went through a, maybe over a month interview, emailed them a trillion times, said, hey, I'm really putting you on the line with grad school. So I'd love for you to tell me. They didn't care. And I didn't get the job. And I, I went to grad school didn't think that it was the right path for me because I wanted to stay in Philly and wanted to do on the ground work, but everything works the way it should. I went to grad school, got my degree. It was absolutely the right decision when it, when it happened. So. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm, yeah. glad that, I'm glad that you made the decision to go. <laughs> or time made the decision. Okay. Right. right. Um, well, that, that's good. So what, what concentration did you go into Emory as, if any? Yeah, so I, the concentration for Emory went down the health education path again. So uh, Emory had a behavioral sciences and health education track. So that was naturally what was aligned with everything I've done in health promotion, health education. Um, so I pursued that route. I believe they changed the name now and I don't want to mess it up. But yeah, I did behavioral sciences and health, and health education. They called it BSHE. Okay, awesome, awesome. And yeah, programs always changing, like concentration. Always. <laughs> can't, you can't keep up, man. Yeah, yeah. It's very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so while you were in your MPH, you were a health education specialist at Get Healthy. So tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so part of Emory's program, they have a real, they, they call it the real program. And what it means is that you they pay employers $6 and then employers pay the other half $6 so that all students receive a, 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 what do you call it, Sal what is it called, salary, $12 an hour um, to work at a particular organization. So that's also the great part about Emory. I think I'll just shout out Emory's uh, graduate program. Also, it's a good, amazing way to incentivize employers to hire grad students because they're basically only paying half the cost to hire a very enthusiastic grad student who also needs the experience. Um, so I, I worked at Get Healthy as a part of the real program. Um, and it was just getting started. It was, a, I believe the founder was actually a former Emory alum and he was getting started. Um, it was like a startup and he needed Bishi students to help with kind of categorizing um, the work that they were doing. And so it was kind of like first kind of like startup experience. Um, he was very um, flexible and like agile <laughs> and things like that. So it was like a good experience to just kind of see how like someone started something from the ground up and um, and it was like kind of like my part-time gig. So that was good too. Awesome, awesome. Well, yeah, shout out to Emory for that. That, that definitely is awesome. And I think like more programs should think about how they could do that to support more students and get them into cool opportunities. Yeah, and, and get paid too, which is great as a grad student, as we all know, so. Definitely, definitely. I, I think I got paid $10 an hour, so that $12 is nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, $12. Yeah, it's really good. Awesome. And you also were a graduate research assistant at Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University, so mm -hmm. tell me about that, about that experience. Yeah, so I was a graduate research assistant with the Emory Prevention Research Center, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what you're referencing? Yes. yes. So again, that was another part of my real experience. Um, so working there, I also enjoyed it because it was a part of a um, the public health training centers, which I think all of um, some people may or may not be aware of, but public health, within the public health field, we have a series of training centers across the country that are really focused on, one, they conduct research within their local communities across the country, and two, they provide education across the board for public health professionals on certain skill sets, knowledge, topics, et cetera. Really enjoyed working there because it was, it was based in um, it was based in Emory and the work that I did there um, was somewhat focused on smoke-free housing. And so that's kind of what 
jog my memory, not jog my memory. Um, it's something that helped me identify what it is I particularly enjoy within the public health field, which throughout grad school led me down to like the social determinants of health. I think one working in Philly kind of got my, my wheels turning, obviously living and breathing um, within a community that didn't have access to, you know, as much fresh fruits and vegetables as we'd like, or, you know, um, you know, sidewalks and all of that jazz. Um, but being able to kind of like work at that intersection got me, you know, a little bit more jazz because I realized, okay, I really like working on the social determinants of health. And so this was just kind of another one of those experiences that led me there with like smoke-free housing. And that makes a lot of sense. And, and that's another cool opportunity that you got. And uh, another opportunity that you had during your MPH was a community scholar at Neighbor Works America. So what was mm -hmm. that about? Yeah, so that's kind of like what I was saying. It kind of like, this was the beginning of me realizing, hey, I really like working at the intersection of, you know, health and housing, social terms of health, really impacting health equity and those uh, system level factors that influence health within communities. I was really focused on chronic disease in particular. So anything that affected like physical activity, nutrition, and preventable, you know, health outcomes. And so with NeighborWorks America, I knew that I had a, a strong interest in social terms of health. Couldn't really identify, this is just a tip, it doesn't help to identify social determinants of health jobs, right? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot's going to come up and a lot's not going to be helpful. And so what I did was I said, hey, I really like housing. I'm working on this housing project. Maybe I could work for an affordable housing agency to just learn a little bit more. And so I was reading an Emory newsletter and they mentioned something about NeighborWorks America. And I realized it was a housing agency. And so I saw that they had a fellowship program. And so since they had a fellowship program, I applied and they accepted me. And so then um, they said they were starting a health and housing initiative. I was like, great, because I really just wanted to work on housing, but great that like I can work exactly at the intersection I'm looking for. Um, so I did that for one summer and I interned there, loved my boss. And she um, told me the year later, they were going to open up a larger fellowship so that, could, you know, you can do it for a year. And so that's kind of what led me to my first job out of grad school. Um, because they have this, you know, longer term fellowship program that I could work on for a year. Okay, awesome. And we'll touch on that fellowship program in a bit. Okay, thank, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, so I wanted to ask you, you, you said that, well, you initially said that you, you chose not to go to grad school because you wanted to live some life before going to school mm -hmm. and having like a, a job and whatnot. And mm -hmm. then you did the AmeriCorps experience in Philly for a year. And now you're like going through your MPH program and getting uh, a bunch of experiences, both on like these in the academic side, as well as like on the actual like professional and, and mm -hmm. community work. Do you think mm -hmm. it was it was very fruitful for you taking that like gap year and doing the AmeriCorps and, and then doing your MPH? And tell me, tell me more about insights on that. Oh yeah, I'm extremely biased. Anyone that comes anywhere close to me and asks me, what should I do after undergrad? I tell them take a gap year. Even, bef even before, I'm an advocate of the gap year. Even if you wanna do it between high school and college, um, I'm a huge advocate. I would have taken longer if I literally did not apply for grad school mm -hmm. my junior year of undergrad, right? Um, I believe that you definitely wouldn't, don't have to even do it like me, right? I happen to do uh, AmeriCorps opportunity. I'm a huge fan of AmeriCorps. Um, it's an amazing way to gain experience. It's an amazing way to give back. Um, and communities need us, right? Like communities, communities, not, not, okay, let me take that back. That sounds awful. I'm not saying communities need us, right? there is always a space for volunteers, right? We have so much, there's so much work that needs to be done on the ground. Um, 
that if you are willing to volunteer, why not, right? If you have the time to volunteer, why not? Um, I wish I could have stayed at, at the school to, I told you I loved helping the kids, um, the kindergartners learn, <laughs> you know, to read. And part of that was seeing that like, you're not able to attend to every single child, right? When you have 30 folks, 30 kids in the classroom, and you have one teacher, right? She can't, she can't teach everyone. She couldn't teach everyone how to read and give, you know, specific personalized care to every single child. And so having volunteers there who are willing and able to also assist was key. And if, if you're willing to do that, I highly recommend, you know, so miracles one route, but what it boils down to is really taking time to better understand where you can best use your skill set, or taking time to understand what, where, what you feel comfortable is your next step. So that whenever you are taking the next step, you have less regret or no regret, you know, and that's okay. So even if you take a year off and you are sitting down <laughs> and you, you know, you're sitting down volunteering in your local community, you know, working a, a job, but you're able to just spend a little bit of time with yourself, understanding exactly where you're comfortable making the next step. That's important. And I recommend everyone do that before you, one, go to grad school and potentially obtain a, a, a serious amount of debt <laughs> if you're not able to pay what, what it costs to go to grad school. And that's a real, that's a reality for especially private institutions like Emory. And then also, if you go into grad school, just selecting a major or a concentration that you don't necessarily feel passionate about, right? Um, it's, that's not, I don't think that's necessary. So you can take time for yourself to really better understand where it is that you want to go. So I highly recommend. Yeah, and I completely understand and, and think and support that, especially like if you if you have no clue what you want to do, it doesn't make sense just jumping into a master's of public health program because mm -hmm. public health in itself is just vast. You're just going to end up in a whirlpool and going to have too many things tugging at you. So really understanding like what you are trying to do so you can kind of align everything, I think is very helpful. And if, yeah. that, if that means a gap year, yeah, for sure. And yeah, you can yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I also, um, I also think this is probably just outside of public health of my life philosophy. There's so much of a rush to get somewhere, right? That's just like a part of our culture within the US. It's just, you know, you're, you're hurrying up to get to the next milestone. You're hurrying up to get to that next, to accomplish that next goal. And truly in the scheme of things, one to two years, when you look at your life as a whole, is not going to make that big of a difference, right? So it's also, I, I encourage folks, you can, this might be my personal opinion, it's okay to slow it down, right? It's, and not that you're going to get it right by slowing it down, but I'm a huge advocate for trusting, trusting your gut and trusting your instincts and doing what's right by you. And I think sometimes you can't do that just because of the pace of our society until you slow it down. Yeah, and I like that just because it, it also like, takes the burden off of like because society is telling you okay do this now and, and all those kinds of things and everyone else is is going along with society to tell you that and yeah. I think like moving at your own pace is absolutely fine so so mm -hmm. definitely definitely don't mm -hmm. force anything and uh figure out mm -hmm. and do your own path because if you listen to this podcast and or listen to all these podcasts you realize that there are so many different paths to to get to where you have to get well, to you have to go there's so many paths i can't express enough there's not one track at all yeah yeah okay so before we get into your fellowship that you got from your internship uh were there any like big takeaways from your mph that you wanted to share oh yeah Big takeaways from my MPH, um, uh, probably like lessons learned. So what I do, let's, let's, let's say things that I didn't do right, that I would highly recommend other people to do, right? I went into grad school very disgruntled, right? I didn't get the job in Philly. They rejected me. I didn't want to be here. I knew I wanted to do on the level, on the ground work, right? Loved AmeriCorps. So I was like, oh, I'm sitting in grad school don't want to be here, spending a whole bunch of money, love Emory, it's my dream school, 
or I can't even appreciate it because I'm like looking at the back door, like, but I would rather be doing X, Y, and Z, right? So big takeaways I would say is one, <laughs> right? It's important to accept where you are, right? And also focus on what you can control, right? There's gonna, there's a lot coming at you at grad school. You can do it all, <laughs> but you also stress yourself out, right? So it's also important for all of us to just like focus on what you can control, except where you are and take advantage of the opportunities that are your way, but don't feel like you need to do it all because everything will come at you. The other big part of grad school that I somewhat regret, um, but I know is so important, is just the networking, right? I could have networked more than I did in grad school and I didn't. It's an amazing opportunity to say that you're a student and you're learning and you'd love to learn more. <laughs> And I, again, somewhat started my first year disgruntled. And I do think I could have done more to network with folks, get to know folks more, um, really figure out where I would align in different, and maybe in different organizations or in different, um, in different uh, spaces within the Atlanta community, right? I lived at home. And so I kind of just like went to school and went home. So highly recommend just taking, when, when you are a student, regardless if it's undergrad or grad school, take advantage of the fact that you can say that you're a student and that you are trying to learn and make those connections. It's so important, like networking is so important. Um, and then we kind of talked about this on the Twitter space, com like combo, um, is that in grad school, what's so important is the critical thinking skills that you gain, right? From being able to connect the dots. That's so important, I think, to how you work, how you work in the real world, quote unquote. Um, but I also think what's so important in grad school is to take advantage of all the experiences outside of the classroom, right? And that's through volunteer opportunities, which I did take advantage of. Um, but just like taking advantage of all the experience that you can gain outside of school. Um, I was in Atlanta and I lived there. So I think sometimes I was like a little bit like, okay, I'm just going to go home or I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> hang with my friends. This is the, literally, I lived like 15 minutes away from the school. Um, so I think that I would have, if I went, if I went somewhere else that wasn't my home, I think I would have taken advantage of it differently even though I had a great experience at Emory and I don't regret that to any degree. I think I absolutely could have taken advantage of like focusing on what I can control, not getting overwhelmed with everything. Um, also networking and then taking advantage of any experience that you can get outside of the classroom. Yeah, okay. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. Though. That's definitely some great insights there. And, and I, I could understand like the comfort of just being at home and just like being in Atlanta and knowing, uh, okay, I guess go to school, go to home and not, not go to school. <laughs> it's like it was like high school for me, you know? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like you just go go to school, go home, like, oh, what's for dinner, you know, like <laughs> that kind of thing. So I think there's a lot, there's a lot I would have done differently. Yeah, it is interesting, like reflecting on it, just just seeing that there were like more chances for you to connect with other peers or professors or whatever the case might be, or to just take advantage of other opportunities in the Atlanta region to, to do work, mm -hmm. as you said, outside of school. And yeah, yeah. and one, one other thing that I want to highlight like, from what you said is like, as you're, as you're a student, the people are more willing to to take your annoyances to like message people and message them again and message them even more and you you yeah. you will get that that person to reach back out to you yeah take advantage you you have the golden ticket i'm a student and i am interested in learning more that can be your intro to anything <laughs> is that <laughs> simple golden ticket. It's, it's that simple so like take advantage for sure Awesome, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Okay, so you graduated, and as you stated a little bit earlier, you were in this internship at Neighborhood Works America, and it shifted into a fellowship. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about how, how uh, like what you did in, in the fellowship. Yeah, so my fellowship, um, I worked on their health and housing initiative. They just, when I joined, they started the health and housing initiative maybe like a couple of months to, to, it was no more than a year. Um, so it, 
a lot of that work involved the groundwork to get this initiative off the ground. You can go and Google it now, it's great. I love to like look back, they're doing amazing work um, at NeighborWorks America. Um, but as part of my work, they really focus on convenings. Um, and so they, part of NeighborWorks America's role was to educate affordable housing providers on a wide variety of affordable housing issues that I can't even get into right now that I also learned a lot about. So it wasn't just focused on health, they do everything, credentialing, education, research. And so health and housing was just a tiny piece of the pie. Uh, but what I helped work on was also just a grant opportunity. So getting grants for the, for the organization to be able to do some of the work that they wanted to do. Particularly, I believe it was also around um, like um, safe and healthy housing. And so that was one of the first grants that we applied for. And then I, I helped with that whole process, the grant writing process. And then in addition, the, the, probably the biggest piece of the pie was just the convening aspect. So creating a program or a meeting that helped educate affordable housing providers on the basics of the intersection of health and housing. And what that really means is breaking it down all the way to, okay, so by creating this affordable housing in this given area, this is the impact you can potentially have on your tenants by giving them access to a community garden, safe housing, you know, um, sidewalks, access to a grocery store, and connecting those dots for affordable housing providers, and then showing them the facts of what it looks like when folks aren't able to live in safe and healthy housing and the impact that it has um, and how that also impacts them as a, a housing provider. So it was really connecting the dots and you'd be surprised, I'm sure this happens in other fields as well, the light bulbs that did go off because it was for the first time being like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, you know, I didn't know that or, I had no idea or, you know, that makes a lot of sense now. That explains a lot. So, yeah, so that's the work that I focused on there. So that's, that's really wide scope of work. And yeah, I think in a lot of different like spaces in public health or just in general, they are a lot of, oh, that, that makes sense because there's a lot of intersection in, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways and, and a lot of uh, cross sections, especially especially with housing and like bigger mm -hmm. issues that affect people's lives because it's mm -hmm. just a very complicated issue. Um, yeah. So, so completely, completely understand that. Uh, you said that you did some grant writing. I know, like, um, did you do grant writing during your MPH or was that something mm -hmm. new, new for you? Yeah, I did grant writing in my MPH. So part of the BG program or the, sorry, Behavioral Science and Health Education <laughs> program at Emory, we took, in terms of the hard skills that we um, gained as part of the program, we did grant writing. We also did curriculum development, uh, like program, you know, development type work, evaluation, well, program evaluation, um, and then we had a statistics class. Okay. So we have, all of us that graduated somewhat have those hard skills when it comes to just, you know, evaluation, grant writing, curriculum development, um, and evaluation. So yeah, so I had experience there and just applied it. Okay. And I went to NeighborWorks America. Okay. And, and on the side of looking for the grants, were you someone that, that also did that for NeighborWorks America or was it that they had the institutions or whoever they were trying to get funding from? What was that like for you? No, I mean, when, when I was just starting, I'm sure it's different now, um, but when I was just starting, we were really looking for any opportunity, any, um, any one that would fund a, a health and housing initiative, right? And we weren't focused necessarily on NeighborWorks America. NeighborWorks America, I believe, check me on this, is uh, significantly funded through HUD. Um, but we were looking for grants really for our member organizations. So there's a, there, it's a member, or, NeighborWorks America was a member organization. So each affordable housing provider in various states was considered a member of NeighborWorks America. So we were, we were soliciting grants 
so we could ultimately distribute those to the members to do this kind of work on the ground because they weren't able to apply necessarily for the grant at the national level. Okay, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. thank, thank you for sharing that. And then after your fellowship experience, you moved on to a position as a research scientist at Health Determinants and Disparities Practice at CSRA Incorporated. Yes. So, so tell me more about that. How do you, how do you come across it and then what do you do? Yeah, so my fellowship ended at Neighbor Works America and they couldn't extend it. It was very sad. Um, again, everything isn't roses, right? <laughs> I found this great opportunity. It was amazing. I, I probably could have stayed there, but you sometimes you can't, right? And so I had to move on because my fellow spended for a year and they couldn't fund it anymore. Um, so I found a job working in a, working at CSRA, which is now, oh my gosh, I'm gonna forget the name. It's, an, it's a large <laughs> government contracting company. It, it merged right when I left. But the work that I did there was really focused on curriculum development for healthcare professionals. So very, and also very specific. So I worked on a physician cultural competency program, as well as a behavioral health cultural competency program. And it was funded through a grant from the Office of Minority Health. And you can look it up now. Um, it's called Think Cultural Health. Great opportunity to, if you work with physicians or nurses or um, disaster professionals and they need cultural competency education. It's an online program, online e-learning program, and they can receive credits to, by completing the program. And so a part of this work, which I really, really loved, um, and I also affirmed that I love working on the organizational level with professionals to educate them about a particular topic that ultimately impacts the people that they serve. Um, but I loved the focus groups that I was able to conduct with folks to build the program. So within this job, I built a program from like start to finish. So I was particularly responsible for the behavioral health e-learning program and it is a two year process. So it's extensive and we conducted focus groups at eight different locations across the country with behavioral health providers. I became a trained focus group moderator, which I loved. Um, and we literally got their insights on, hey, if we create a cultural competency program, what does it look like to when you serve patients? And we met with them for about an hour. They gave us insights. We synthesized all of that information. Um, and we wrote it into a curriculum that was about three and a half hours long. Um, I, that's a condensed version of what we did, but it was a two-year process. And we also worked with an advisory committee. Um, so I love that aspect of it. I love building a curriculum from start to finish, but the majority of the work there was focused on building that curriculum. Okay. Uh, that, that's awesome. And uh, two, two things that I, that I think were cool from what you said, or like uh, just, just should highlight uh, like a tangible example of working on the organizational level, because especially like in public health and junior MPH or your bachelor's, you're just talking mm -hmm. about theory a lot of the time, but like mm -hmm. I, I like that you gave a tangible example of working with like these providers who are going to like impact their community and how that like works in public health. And I completely, mm -hmm. completely forgot the second thing that I was going to say, but uh, that, <laughs> that's, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's fine. And, and yeah, and also just to underscore what you said, a lot of folks sometimes aren't able to see the, the variety of paths you can take, right, within public health. And so with CSRA, when I worked for, okay, the company's called GDIT now, it just clicked. It's, it's no longer CSRA, it's called GDIT. It's a large government contracting company. But with CSRA, when I was applying, it would never necessarily be on a list of public health organizations. It's a large government contracting company in D the DC area. Um, they just happen to have a small, when I tell you our practice was tiny compared to the types of contracts that they get from the federal government. And, but there's public health work there. So it's also just like a lesson to don't limit yourself um, to just keep, keep stay open-minded because there's public health opportunities everywhere. And I was able to directly use my skill set that I, gained in grad school through that job um, 
and it was it was really really fun work so also encourage folks to look beyond the traditional agencies that you might describe as public health because they're still having an impact other organizations still having an impact as well yeah i'm, I'm glad that you also highlighted that because like there's there's so much work that the, the government, whether that's federal, state, county, does with contracting companies. And a lot of that work does require like people like skill sets with people from public health can do. So even mm -hmm. looking in to those larger or not so larger organizations that mm -hmm. do that type of work is is a valuable thing. And I also yeah. remember the the other point that I was gonna make, it was around like the you saying. Uh, you're developing this curriculum and it just sounds like it's a very short process but it took two years and I think that's a key mm -hmm. point to also realize people that these things take time and it's not it's not like like you want to do something and you want to get it done now but like especially mm -hmm. when you're bringing together people and collecting multiple mm -hmm. forms of data, data yeah. it, it, it takes a while to, to collect all of that and then yeah. like come up with the final project so I just want to yeah. highlight that as well yeah definitely it's a, it's everything is a process yeah. And then you moved, you know, you transitioned out of this role and into a manager of education at America's Essential Hospitals. So tell me mm -hmm. about, about that transition and then what do you do in that job? Yeah, so I transitioned out of that role. Um, again, now this theme of theme in my career of working on this organizational level, impacting professionals that ultimately serve, you know, vulnerable populations. Uh, that was kind of, I was like, okay, I, I enjoy this. I think it also is a theme if you are living or working in the DC area, because DC has a lot of national organizations and headquarters here. So that's also, I think, has impacted my career trajectory. So I, when I took the role at America's Essential Hospitals, I was very interested in the leadership development aspect because I worked on cultural competency programs. So it was kind of a line that's like, okay, I really enjoy working on, you know, professional development for folks. Um, and so at, at America's Essential Hospitals, I worked with healthcare executives who were particularly focused on almost, let's say one to two steps below the C-suite. And so they wanted to be a part of a leadership development program so they gained the skills that they needed to ultimately lead, um, lead health systems across the country. With America's Essential Hospitals, um, we particularly focused on, on essential hospitals, which um, basically are defined as hospitals that serve, uh, the only way, the easiest way to describe it is just safety net hospitals. So, folks, so hospitals across the country that serve those that are most vulnerable and so I was working with healthcare professionals that were in the C-suite, on their way to the C-suite and helping them with leadership development programs. So there were two programs I particularly ran. One was a fellows program, another was an Essential Women's Leadership Academy, really focused on women's leadership. Again, another one of those things that it looks pretty on the outside, like, you know, oh, it's a, a nine-month program. And you know, it includes 30 folks and this is what it includes, but it takes a lot of maintenance and preparation, you know, for, um, preparation on the back end to make sure that it runs smoothly. So I kind of, I was responsible for that entire aspect of, you know, recruiting, recruiting members to be a part of the leadership development program, making sure that I work with, um, I work with a set of consultants to actually deliver the the content, but making sure that the content was relevant for members, making sure that we're evaluating the program, making sure that it's having the impact that we intend for it to have, um, and then kind of starting that cycle all over again, and making sure ultimately that all of the folks that participated had a great experience. Okay, and at the organization you worked for before, what what type of professionals were you working with there? Was it also like healthcare executives? Yeah, it wasn't healthcare executives, it was healthcare professionals. So um, particularly behavioral health providers um, and then physicians, nurses, and then also disaster. Okay, because my, yeah. my, my question was going to be, and I don't know if it's going to be as relevant since it was like healthcare type people, um, 
because you got your masters of public health and and with a public health degree of course you can get into like the health care role mm-hmm. pretty easily but i'm guessing that mm-hmm. you focused more on health education as as we spoke about during your mph so was there like mm-hmm. a, a hard transition for you to to like educate professionals on like well, I guess you, you, you're not really doing it on, on like what their skill sets are mm-hmm. around. It's more on like the leadership side of things. But was there like any difficulty in, in translating what you know to, to teaching them? Yeah, I mean, that's an amazing question. And it's also probably a sneak peek to like my current role. So now I, I work I work as director of healthcare programs at Health Management Academy, extremely ingrained in a healthcare environment. Um, and it's something that I'm constantly grappling with just in terms of how, I, I won't say different healthcare is from public health because that seems insane to say, right? Because we're we're so adjacent, <laughs> like public health and healthcare are, are adjacent, it's not the same, um, but it has been such a learning curve for me to learn about the issues that impact healthcare professionals compared to public health professionals. So abs- to, you, to, so to your question, yes, it, it, there, is a, there is a difference for sure. Um, there's a learning curve. The challenges, opportunities are not the same. Um, and so all of this is kind of like, my experience at um, CSRA somewhat set up a light bulb because I was like working with behavioral health, physicians. So I kind of got a taste moving to America's Essential Hospitals, working with, you know, C-suite leaders. I definitely got a taste of what, you know, the issues are in healthcare, even though I was focused on leadership development more in particular healthcare issues. But my current role, I'm solely focused on healthcare, current healthcare priorities and issues for C-suite executives. And I would say that it is interesting. I'm sure there's a lot of intersection with public health, but it is very different. And how how do you manage to grapple with that? Is it just like having conversations with people and reading different articles mm-hmm. and things like that around the industry or what are different ways? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the good part, I mean, personality wise, I'm I'm someone that considers myself a continuous learner. So I love that aspect of it because I don't know a whole bunch about it. So it gives me an opportunity to learn. Like anytime I hear something that I'm not aware of, I'm constantly Googling like, okay, that's interesting, right? Um, so I love that personally because that's just who I am. Um, but yeah, I learn, I've learned through conversations. A huge part of my current role is one-on-one dialogue with healthcare um, execs. And so I learn through them. They they we talk about their priorities, talk about their challenges. So I learn how their challenges intersect with the current environment that we're all a part of and what their priorities are and also what's top of mind and the issues that they're facing. So I would say that um, I learned by, by chatting with them um, and then also just learning on my own. But it is a very interesting experience to just be, to have such a public health <laughs> background. I see myself as a public health professional, that's my identity. But yeah, to work completely in healthcare is, is very interesting. Okay, and, and like to, to that point right there, so you, you moved from your manager of education role at America's Essential Hospitals into the director of healthcare programs at the Health Management Academy. What, mm-hmm. what was that thought process like for you? That thought process for me was really COVID, to be honest. Um, it was in the middle of the pandemic and I ran in person, I ran in person training programs. And what does that look like for a health educator if you run in-person training programs during COVID, right? The the instinct, I mean, I think we can all reflect on um, March 20th. I mean, I think we're coming up on the the year anniversary, right? Mm -hmm. Where everything shut down. I had a program that ended um, March 12th, 2020 was their graduation. And I work with healthcare executives. and, And what I'll remember from that time was that say I had a class of 30 folks we ended we ended the graduation with probably half of them there because there was this you know this virus that you know we had to get a handle of and you know we don't know what it is and we don't know if it's spreading within you know our immediate graduation ceremony 
And so being responsible for in-person training programs um, during a pandemic is just, yeah, <laughs> that was the impetus. <laughs> Okay, that that makes that makes a lot of sense. And uh, yeah, how 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 is that work different from what you're doing? Like, how is the work that you're doing now different from what what you did before? Like, okay, I guess you could just answer, what do you do right now? Yeah, yeah. I mean, no, it, it's a good question. It's very different. Uh, the work I did previously was focused on leadership development, um, and the work I do now is more focused on peer learning. So, peer learning focused on key healthcare topics or priorities, challenges. You can kind of sub it for any noun that you'd like. But the work that I do now is a lot more ingrained in the issues that are impacting healthcare professionals. I particularly work with a subset of healthcare execs. That's how my organization's organized. So I work with uh, particularly COOs as well as chief human resources officers at healthcare organizations. And so it's just being ingrained in those issues, being deeply ingrained in those issues and creating peer learning opportunities so they're able to learn from each other. And so that was very different from what I did previously because it was more focused on leadership development, large cohort, um, kind of three, three training programs as part of a larger program. This is more focused on creating meetings, two and a half day style meetings, focused on key issues within this particular subset of healthcare executives, and also only focus on key issues. So it varies from uh, it varies from e each meeting because I'm I'm solely focused on their priorities. Okay, yeah, that's interesting, and um, that, that's awesome. And I, I think it just shows like the value of peer leading and how important that could be because there's a lot that goes on there. Because as as we said earlier, everyone's just so ingrained in their own own life. Um, it's, mm -hmm. it's easy to miss out on other opportunities to learn from what others are doing, and and just seeing how that can translate and help the work that you're doing. Yeah, absolutely. I I can't stress it enough. I. I can't stress enough the value of peer learning, even in, in formal, informal, right? This is more of a formal setting. It's a membership-based organization. They pay to learn from each other. There are so many opportunities also just for public health professionals to dive into the free opportunities to learn from your peers, even if someone is doing the same work that you do in another city, in another you know, organization, you can learn so much by learning how other folks are approaching similar challenges yeah. so absolutely absolutely uh so you are the founder of smart health education i follow you on yes. instagram at smart health yes. education uh where you are working on where you focus on connecting the dots between training design and engaging leading uh, experiences in public health yeah. so what, what was the thought process in starting this yeah so the thought process in starting that was actually covid right so I told you about the, um, when COVID hit and you're planning in-person training programs as part of your job, right? You, I mean, I think we all took, I think I'm not overstepping my bounds here. I think we all took a step back and were, have been somewhat reflective throughout COVID, you know? Granted, you know, you have your health strength and it's a blessing to be able to, you know, self-reflect and figure out where it, where is it you want to go and what is you want to do. And so through that process of seeing what it looks like to plan in-person training programs, specifically for healthcare execs, I had this moment where I realized that we're all human in this and that the same education that healthcare executives receive at the end of their career is just as important to anyone at any stage of their career. That's what I kept on going back with. I'm like, you know what? People have imposter syndrome when they're in the C-suite. And people have imposter syndrome the day that you graduate from high school, undergrad. And it's no different because we're all human. And so as a part of that, because I focus so much on professional development, as you can see for you know, various health professionals, I, I realized that one of my personal passions is just in designing, engaging and learning experiences for folks. Because to your point earlier about the value of peer learning, the value of just learning from others. 
I realized that there is a huge opportunity to just create more engaging experiences, particularly in training, in public health, to help folks learn from one another, learn about these key topics, key skills. And like, that's where my skill set lies. And that's also the most important thing is what I love to do. And I think I can have the biggest impact in public health. So it took me a while, again, going back to this general theme <laughs> that we talked about, but like things take time, right? So I thought about it for a while when I was in my current job, my last job, because it's like, hey, this is kind of important. But it kind of took COVID um, that gave me that motivation to really be like, you know, I want to formalize this. Um, this is where I kind of see it landing in the scheme of things. And then this is where I, I my skill set seems to be best aligned to what how I can impact, ultimately impact public health. So that's how I started it. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So what, what, what was that thought process of what, what you were going to do? Because you said that uh, you get given a lot of these skills and trainings to healthcare executives and other people mm -hmm. in, in generally in life can, can benefit from it. So was it that you were trying to do that same, a, a similar um, like mass? You, you tell oh, me. Like, <laughs> like yeah. style? Yeah. yeah, so definitely not reinventing the wheel, right? Mm -hmm. So don't want to do the same thing that I know other organizations do or the current organizations I work for do, right? It's really providing more opportunities for working with either regional or smaller organizations who may not have the opportunity to hire a, a, a full staff of education professionals, right? To create these training programs that are necessary. Um, so being able to, you know, help folks who may not have like the full resources to create those, the, an education program for folks being a resource for, for them. And then also I'm really just big broadly um, on the tie between professional development and personal development um, as an ongoing process within your career. And so that's another aspect of smart health education that I wanted to bring to the table that I think somewhat is lacking in the field. We do a lot on, on professional development you know, making sure that you gain the hard skills, but it's also the soft skills that are really important and that's ongoing. And so I want to fill that gap as well um, so that you're also focused on kind of how we started this, this podcast. Just time management is so key, building strong habits, like focusing on your, um, your mental health and, you know, managing burnout, like shout out to Marissa, right? <laughs> like, and the work that she's doing, it's all of that's important for public health professionals because it ultimately impacts how we serve others. And so that's that's kind of where I see myself falling in the scheme of things. Okay, awesome, awesome. And that, that, that is dope. And I definitely see that there is a gap there. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you you also saw that and, and like uh, taking actions to actually fill that gap and give people the necessary tools and resources to be successful in that in that uh, development that is necessary mm -hmm. that's awesome so how how has it evolved from starting during the pandemic to now how has smart health education evolved oh gosh it's evolved just like everything in life again going back to the theme but you have to adapt right mm -hmm. not and nothing is roses okay um even though i can spell out my life story it's it's not easy and so how it's evolved is I started it, I started it as a career development learning hub, right? Because I was solely focused from the leadership development aspect that I came from, from my previous role. And even though leadership development is 100% necessary, I'm a huge advocate for leadership development from day one. Like when you're hiring folks, we need to be focused on their, their ongoing development and how we're um, developing them in, into um, into just strong employees, right? And giving them the skills. But how it's transitioned is less on, less focus on leadership development or career development and more of a focus on, okay, there are key skill sets that we need within a given role, right? Within a given organization, or there are also key topics that we need to educate a particular audience on and how can 
how can I help you create an experience that also results in knowledge transfer, right? So we all hate PowerPoints that are 55 minutes long and you, someone's just talking at you. And whenever it's really important for you to obtain that information, right? Because you want you to do your job better in your day-to-day -day life, or you want you to learn this particular skill set, knowledge, whatever. It's so important that you're creating learning experiences that people actually can take and apply to the work that they do. And so that's where I see myself falling in the scheme of things. Um, and that's how it's evolved. So I realized I love career development because that's just a passion of mine. Like, like I said, personal and professional development, but really what, where my skill set best lies is creating those training opportunities for folks. Okay, that's awesome. And look forward to seeing that uh, continue to develop. And, yes, uh, yes, it's a process, but yeah, I'm, I, lo I love how it's evolving. Absolutely, absolutely, and that, that, that's dope. Um, I guess last question around this is, I guess it makes sense why it's an LLC as opposed to a, a nonprofit, but was there any like, thinking in your mind around maybe this being a nonprofit or anything like that? Or were you just like, um, this seems like a pretty solid model for an LLC because it has a lot of, it has a model where you can like get income type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. And also something, to be honest, I did not necessarily grapple with. If I started a nonprofit, it would actually have a different mission. Fair so, enough. so I think that, uh, that's probably where it where it came from. It's just me seeing a gap in where I can best use my skill set, and then wanting to have a larger impact on public health. Um, if I did start a nonprofit, it would also be tied to like the same theme when it comes to learning, but I would probably focus it more on where I started my career, which is more focused on children, right? I started in an elementary school and I see the, I'm sure we all see the pipeline issue that we have ongoing, especially within the public health field, other healthcare fields. And I do think if I started a nonprofit, it would be focused on creating that pipeline. I tell folks all the time that it shouldn't, not that it shouldn't be hard to recruit public health professionals, but there is a underlying theme, I think with all of us within public health that focuses on service and it focuses on wanting to impact health outcomes. And you can find kids who are in safety patrol, right? They're, they're in the, you know, the certain clubs in middle school and elementary school, right? because they wanna give back in their small community. And not to say that they're all gonna impact, they're all gonna turn into you know, public health professionals, but those, that's a great place to start because that's who I think a lot of us are, right? We have that heart to want to like serve. And so I think if I had a nonprofit, it would really focus on helping, like starting from that level and creating that pipeline and educating kids. Um, on some of those career paths from a very young age to just to start thinking, because I believe you, you can only see, you can only go as far as you see. Yeah, so being yeah. able to, pro being able to provide that opportunity early is so important. Yeah. I, I think just exposure to it because like we're, we're exposed to doctors and nurses and all yeah. that type of thing, but we're not exposed to public health. And, and as, mm -hmm. as and like to the point of like both of us going to undergrad as pre-med students yeah. is like that, that's what you're thinking you could help people with, but there's so yeah. many other ways to help people, Waste. especially yeah. in public health. So yeah, exactly. That's, that's why I always think whenever people talk about the pipeline, I'm like, the pipeline is very clear. All of us are anti-med, right? There's a set of kids right now who are anti-med school. There's the start, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So. Awesome, awesome. Um, so before I move on to the Furious Five, the last uh, five questions, uh, I would like to ask you, where would you like to see yourself in the future? Ooh, <laughs> that's always a good one. I would love to see, I'm, I'm more... I'm a fluffy person. All I hope for my life in the next five years is that I'm at peace. Okay. 
I at peace that. with my decisions, where I am in my career, and where I am with my family and friends. That's all I can ask for. Okay, well, we are sending you all the peace that you can get from now for the next five years and, and more. So I hope thank you, that, thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. I hope that you're able to, to achieve that. Yes. You will achieve that. Let's speak it as I will justice. achieve that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. just going to be a piece, a piece of my decision. Awesome. Oh, yeah. So moving on to the Furious Five, the five questions I ask all guests. All right, number one, what advice would you give to a student trying to pursue a career in public health? The advice I would give them is to trust your gut, take advantage of any opportunity to get any relevant experience, and to be confident in the fact that you are having an impact. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, and number two, if you were talking to someone wanting to get into your position, what advice would you give them? My current position? Yeah, you can talk both for your business as well as your, your, your uh, position. Um, my, I'd say my business, show yourself grace. It takes time. It's also important to be clear on where you want to impact change, very clear. And it's important to niche down whenever you focus on, I think, the business aspect of or entrepreneurship aspect of public health. And then for my current role, I would say someone who wants to be in my current role, um, don't be, I, I, don't be afraid necessarily, or take advantage of opportunities to work with a variety of target audiences. I think one of the values, I spend a lot of time on the phone with, with healthcare executives, and I think being able to have that exposure to a variety of audiences prior to my position and also various topic areas that impact a variety of different audiences helps me in my current role because you feel more confident um, interacting with this particular demographic of folks. Um, and yeah, and, and, and be a continuous learner. Like I said with, you know, previously, I, I don't have a healthcare background. Public health is my background and it's what I love. So it's it's also okay that if you, you don't you don't have to understand everything, but also be willing to learn. Yeah, great advice. Uh, number three, what's something you are working on improving in your life right now? Ooh, I am working on slowing down. Uh, I'm really focused on not trying to do all the things. So I am really big on time management, really big on how I'm managing my time each day. So I give my time, myself time to, like I said, wake up in the morning, ground myself, but also the same thing at the end of the day, right? So time management is huge for me right now. Um, and then the other big thing that I didn't mention, I'm really big into calligraphy. <laughs> that's, my, uh, that's my hobby, I guess you can say. And I am in the process of learning engraving, uh, which is, I can engrave glass, anything glass or uh, any type of hard surface. So also in my free time, that's where you'll find me. I'm typically engraving and um, lettering and doing calligraphy, so. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah. Number four, professionally, do you recommend anything? Yes. Professionally, I recommend a lot of things. <laughs> Professionally, I recommend um, networking <laughs> is key. Uh, making sure that, and I'm not even a strong, I'm by no means an example, it's just lessons learned. Uh, communication is very key. How you communicate your brand, how you communicate your sorry, your personal brand, how you communicate your personal brand, how you communicate your strengths and your transferable skills to organizations so that they understand exactly what you can do for them. Very crucial. It's also very important to, again, kind of my theme, to trust your gut. Find environments where you're able to grow. You do not have to, 
you do not have to suffer by any means. So it's important for you to constantly find places where you're able to grow in and, and where you feel like you can learn and you can um, make yourself, you can be uncomfortable because that's where, that's the biggest point where you are able to kind of make that next step in your career is when you're growing. So really, really focus on finding opportunities that challenge you, where you can learn, where you feel like you're, you're, you can grow. And I think the last thing professionally is just to like show yourself grace. Everything is a process, right? So you're not just going to go from intern to CEO. Maybe you could, right? But trust the process and everything isn't roses, but everything, I won't even say everything happens the way that it should. Um, everything will direct you to where, you, where you're supposed to be. Absolutely. Love, love those, love those. Thank you. And then last but not least, where can people connect with you? Yes, so you can connect with me on LinkedIn. You can connect with me, okay, Kimberly Green Warren. You can connect with me on um, Instagram at Smart Health Education. And you can also connect with me on LinkedIn on Smart Health Education with the LLC. So that's where you'll find me on the internet. Awesome, awesome. I'll be sure to put that in the show notes as well as the respective things into the descriptions. People can check that out, but definitely connect with Kimberly if you're interested in learning more. Just the networking with her and uh, see yes. how she can be uh, of help to, to you on your journey. But thank for you so sure. much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for, for hopping on and taking time to come and chat. I appreciate you sharing your story. Had a pleasure mm-hmm. chatting with you a couple yeah. weeks back, and I'm, I'm glad that we got to chat some more today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is fun. Very reflective. Like, I don't know the last time I've thought back on everything. So really enjoyed the conversation. And thank you again for the invite. Awesome. Awesome. My pleasure. All right. Just some housekeeping items, everyone. Thank you so much for listening and watching to this. Be sure to subscribe if you have not subscribed as yet. Leave a like if you're watching this on YouTube. Leave a five-star review on all platforms. Greatly appreciate that. And share with a friend so other people are able to better navigate their public health journeys and just get some more insights. All right. And if you'd like to support, you can go to thephmillennial.com forward slash support and find all the different ways to support there. But thank you all for listening to me and see you next week.